idea came from, and we've been meeting for about four months now. Um, when it first started, it was just a few few of us, and I'd say now it's really growing. Um, consistently, we've had about nine people showing up, so that feels like it's something's holding, something's sticking, so that's good. Um, so, you know, part of, I think, for me, just to kind of give my own personal share is um, it's been a hard year for me. Um, I lost my job and, and that was, I think for a lot of men is their community or a big part of their community. And uh, so all of a sudden just boom, just no community there. Like very few people have reached out to me um, since then of that group. So I, I lost a lot of connection and um also, um, my dad is in um, a care home right now. Probably not going to make it to the end of the year. He's uh, got dementia. Um, and I think about him versus my mom. So on the one side, my dad is, he doesn't get out of bed. Pretty much my mom's the only one who visits him. He's in Arizona on any kind of consistent basis. Um, so he's isolated. He's got dementia. He's just in a bed. And uh, my mom on the other side, 86, her mind is sharp as a tack. She has a robust community of friends that she can rely on. And I don't think that's a coincidence. You know, I think that's a very gendered thing. And and I think about that as as I um you know we look at our parents and we think um, how do we relate to them what what how is their story similar to ours what can we learn from their story and um, it's really really hard especially for middle aged men to connect to other men um, it's just not easy to do um, so lots of reasons for that but that's just been my experience and so I want to talk a little bit about that. You know, what's, what's, what's wrong with men that needs healing? Why do we have such a hard time being vulnerable? Um, why do we have to have a talk on vulnerability? Why can't we just do it? And so um, I actually want to uh, involve you guys, if you will. Um, so you guys have to do a little bit of a work here. Um, we're going to do something called a think, pair, share. So uh, each of you is going to find a partner in the, in the room. It's a good way to get to know each other or just communicate with each other, connect. And I have a word that I want you to just free associate with each other on. Okay, just what this, this word conjures up for you. And there's not a right or a wrong answer to this word. Just share what you think. And the word is masculinity. So when you hear that word masculinity, what does that stir up for you? What does that conjure for you? So find a partner. Five minutes, so you're going to just talk about this for, with each other. And if you're on Zoom, you can type in the chat what, what it conjures up for you.
Okay, if you haven't, the other person hasn't shared, start to wrap up and let the other person share a little bit. Okay, let's do about one more minute. What is the word masculinity? Uh, what, what associations do you have with that word? Okay, let's uh, wrap it up. Sounds like uh, some good discussion has been happening. So we only have this one microphone. So what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to invite anyone who wants to share uh, anything that their group came up with and, and mostly just like one or two words as opposed to whole sentences, if you will. Um, and then I'll just say them so that the people on Zoom can hear it, okay? And um, I'll share what I see on, on Zoom, somebody said, in vulnerability and daring. So um, who wants to share what their group came up with? Categories and expect categories and expectations is masculinity. Okay. Okay, now I need to know more. <laughs> Go ahead. And that was part of what he could be. I don't know if they heard that. So, um, and then I was saying, kind of similarly for me, um, I'm a strong woman. And so, I when people talk about masculinity, I feel like sometimes I've got an angry black man inside of me, right? I was telling him that. But uh, I also feel like I also have to keep it on the down low because there's lots of environments where that's frowned upon. So I, I feel like I've told him, I feel like I have to hide it. So categories and expectations. And, yes, and, and the community, right? There's uh, some environments, people, where you are expected to behave a certain way. So both of us are thinking in terms of our environment and the expectations of our behavior and how we'll be received.
Okay. So, uh, well, I came up with, uh, again, I'm, I'm a dad. So, um, and just like for me personally, I never felt more like a man than when I took care of my son since he was an infant, like just protecting him and nurturing him. And like, like that felt, that felt so natural, you know? So to me, um, being nurturing, and being protective, just the feeling of, of providing to me is a, is a masculine form of of nurturing and protective. Being protective to me is a natural, uh, a masculine form of of nurturing. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can share. Um, I definitely resonate with um the last speaker saying being a strong woman and needing to um at times keep that on the down low. And so I think that there's maybe, um, an implication that masculinity, um, implies strength and how does strength show up, um, in social environments. Um, and one of the things that I think a lot about is, um, fitting in versus belonging. And a lot of times, um, in social environments, there's, um, an expectation of fitting in. And that's why people tend to enact roles, rather than to just simply be themselves and, um, and, um, belong. Um, so I think the stronger the culture is to fit in and the social hierarchy involved there, um, the less likelihood that people can simply be who they are. Yeah. Um, we talked about it, and there are a lot of general generalizations about it that really aren't so. Every man has his own way of showing his masculinity. But to me, it um, means kindness and generosity and taking care of and being sensual and kind. I think kind keeps coming up for me again. Like, don't hurt me. Be kind to me. That's all. Anyone else would like to share? Maybe Patty? Yeah. Oh, we we talked for what one minute. But um I, I was just telling Dylan that um for me, um masculinity, because my my family, I was explaining to Dylan this um like 30% of us, and it's a big family, are, are gay. For, and it's my family, maybe that's kind of a higher percentage than, than the population, but that's the case. And so I was uh, saying that uh, masculinity is, a, for me, very fluid. Um, it can be embodied in a female body or a male body. And that's, I didn't have much time to talk. I just was jumping. <laughs> that's what I was, exp and, and then my, our, my dad was um, a masculine in a very traditional way. So it's kind of hard for him to uh, I don't know if I'm on the right track or not, but I only had a minute, so.
Am I not being heard? Yeah, this the lavaliers are just cutting in and out, and I have no idea why. Because that Can might you take be... over with the mic again. Possibly. Okay. There's no more uh, in fair share, so we'll be good. We can hear you now. Well, they can hear yes, you now does. with this. If I do this, can you hear me? Yeah, as soon as Dylan got up there and started messing with the iPad, we could hear again. Yeah, I just... Just hold it like this? No, just, you can go back. I just turned on this audio, so you're going to be streaming through here. Okay. But we're just using that for in. Okay. So um, I want to read something from the... So speaking of non-traditional, um, being a psychologist, um, there's very few of us. And in my graduate school classes, I was often the only one in my class, um, men, that is. Um, but these are the guidelines from the American Psychological Association that came out in 2019. Uh, first time ever they published guidelines for working with boys and men. And uh, I just thought this was interesting to read. For decades, psychology focused on men, particularly white men, to the exclusion of all others. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that, you know, especially white men, we were born into privilege. And so um, it's, it's sometimes could feel hard to feel sorry for white men uh, because look at everything that they have. But um, uh, so just want to acknowledge that, yes, from a hierarchical standpoint, it is easier to be a white man. Um, and this, is made, this point is made by what they say in the beginning of this guideline. Uh, men still dominate professionally and politically. As of 2018, 95.2% .2 of chief operating officers at Fortune 500 companies were men. According to a 2017 analysis by Fortune, in 16 of the top companies, 80% of all high-ranking executives were male. Meanwhile, the 115th Congress, which began in 2017, was 81% male. This is continues uh, from the guidelines, but something is amiss for men as well. Men commit 90% of homicides in the United States and represent 77% of homicide victims. They're the demographic group most at risk of being victimized by violent crime. They are 3.5 times more likely than women to die by suicide, and the life expectancy is 4.9 years shorter than women's. I read just this morning, I, I don't know, I haven't verified the source, but that one in five men in the Americas died before the age of 50. Um, it's in relationship to something vis-a-vis -vis toxic masculinity. So I'm not sure exactly how they're defining what, what that leads to, but certainly suicide. And, and we'll talk about how um, um, isolation can, be, can kill as well. Um, 13 years in the making, the psychologists draw on more than 40 years of research showing that traditional masculinity is psychologically harmful and that socializing boys to suppress their emotions causes damage that echoes both inwardly and outwardly. The main thrust of the subsequent research is that traditional masculinity, marked by stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression, is on the whole harmful. Men socialized in this way are less likely to engage in healthy behaviors. For example, the 2011 study found that men with the strongest beliefs about masculinity we're only half as likely as men with more moderate masculine beliefs to get preventative health care. So there's part of it right there. Um, in 2007, researchers at Boston College found that more men conformed to masculine, that the more men conform to masculine norms, the more likely they were to consider as normal, risky health behaviors such as heavy drinking, using tobacco, and avoiding vegetables, <laughs> and to engage in these risky behaviors themselves. This masculine reluctance towards self-care extends to psychological health. Uh, research found that men who bought into traditional notions of masculinity were more negative about seeking mental health services than those with more flexible gender attitudes. Because of the way many men have been brought up to be self-sufficient and able to take care of themselves, any sense that things aren't okay needs to be kept secret. Part of what happens is men who keep things to themselves look outward and see that no one else is sharing any of the conflicts that they feel inside. That makes them feel isolated. They think they're alone. They think they're weak. They think they're not okay. They don't realize that other men are also harboring private thoughts and private emotions and private conflicts. Um, so this disconnection 
um, that, that is happening among men in modern society. Um, I think is is talk, there's a uh, author Terence Real. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name, but he's a psychologist. And he wrote this book. I have the books up here, by the way, if you want to look at later. I don't want to talk about it. Uncovering the secret legacy of male depression. His book is basically talking about how men can carry this thing called covert depression, where they they don't show it outwardly. It comes out often in the form of anger. Um, in addiction and these other behaviors, workaholism, because they just can't express it. So this is Terence Riel. In our culture, we turn boys into men through disconnection. To learn to disconnect from your feelings, from your vulnerabilities, and from others is what we call autonomy and independence. That's a traumatic wound and a hidden one because it's culturally normative. The essence of toxic masculinity is invulnerability. The more vulnerable you are, the more girly you are. The more invulnerable you are, the more manly you are. So the fragility of, fragility of being human, the simple human vulnerability is suppressed. Men are trying to live up to a standard which is inhuman. And they're dogged by a sense of falling short of that standard over and over again. That's pretty powerful stuff. So, um, you know, I think that's part of what draws me to Buddhism, honestly, is um, it's self-exploration, compassion, right? It's one of the uh, two um, aims of, of bodhicitta, root wisdom and compassion. Um, not a traditional invulnerable male thing to be compassionate. Um, I would also say that um, I, like many men, in, in looking for connection, uh, probably over rely on my wife for that. Um, in not having enough men in my life that I could do that with. Um, and I'd say that's probably true for um, the bulk of straight men. And um, as they get older, they tend to over rely on their spouses. Um, and then that puts a lot of pressure on their spouses to be on top of all the other caregiving responsibilities that women have, to be there for their, their husbands, their spouses. Uh, this is an interesting statistic. Married people have lower rates of mortality than their age matched single peers. The degree of protection was five times for men what it is for women. So men are benefiting from being married more than women are. Right, and I think it's that 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 connection that we're getting in, in our relationships that uh, we're over relying on our on our wives to give us a straight men. Um, so this idea of um, isolation and loneliness. Um, and the last time we gave, I talked a lot about this. Um, how neuroscience is demonstrating a lot of aspects of Buddhism, and one of them is interpersonal neurobiology, how um, everything and everyone is truly interconnected on, a, um, on multiple levels. Um, and it helps us to understand why loneliness can kill. Um, and so, um, yeah, and I think that's looking at my dad, his state, what would it be like if he, if he hadn't been so isolated? Where would he be now? So, okay, let's get back to men's groups. Why a men's group in particular? Why can't we be vulnerable as easily with women other than our wives? Um, so it's an interesting phenomenon that, that men have a harder time being vulnerable with women. Um, the book of him over here, Stift, has anyone read Susan Polity, second wave feminist? Awesome. Um, so she wrote a book called Stift in the 90s about um, how patriarchy harms men as well as women. Um, at the time, it was a kind of a novel concept, but she did different chapters for different examples of that in society. And has anyone heard of the Citadel? It's a military school. Um, I think it's, is it army? Anyway, um, so back in the 90s, it had been traditionally for years, uh, men only. 
and um, a woman successfully sued to join the Citadel. And there, it was just a great healing cry. Um, and they were trying whatever they could to make this not happen. And what Susan Faludi found is that it was actually a lot of the reasons were counter to what you might expect. When one of them was when the, these men were on their own in this place, they could actually be vulnerable with each other. Without a woman there, they could do things like um, cry with each other, hug each other. Like they, they could break down that, that mask of invulnerability that they had to show in front of women and they could let themselves be open with each other. So that's just one example, I think. Um, I think that when you see other men doing it, you know, being vulnerable and opening yourself up to unlearning, deconditioning the isolation and emotional depression, it feels a little bit safer. Like if you're the, if you're the one who's initiating it, um, like here's something that I, I find, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but okay, so you meet another couple and my wife immediately goes to hug the woman, hugs the man, I hug the woman, the man and I look at each other. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, do we shake hands? Do we hug? And I'm like, I want to, you know, screw this patriarchy. I, let's hug. And I'll go in for a hug. And about 50% of the time, the guy sticks his hand out kind of preemptively. <laughs> and then I feel really awkward. and like, what? I did something wrong. And I feel embarrassed. Right? Like, so I think that's an example of... of we want to be invulnerable, we want to open up and share, but we don't want to be the first one to do it. So a safe group sort of place, it begins to break that down. I think that um, as us men try to move into more of this non-traditional way of being, um, this more open way, um, it's not always accepted in large society. Um, you know, I was looking at a lot of examples on um, YouTube of these podcasts and things where they were sharing. It's it's not a good idea to open up and be vulnerable with our women. Um, that it's going to be thrown back in your face, and I found that interesting. Um, but um, what I will say is, from my personal experience, um, there has been a lot of situations where my trying to be a non-traditional man was not welcome to open arms by women. And one example is um, when my kids were younger, um, I would do a lot of the childcare and I'd take uh, them to the playground. And I'd look around and I'd see the moms at the playground all kind of bonding together. And um, I'd be over there by myself and nobody would invite me over. They wouldn't even look at me. Um, so I was by myself with my kids, not feeling like I fit in. That's just kind of a, a little mini example of that. Um, and, you know, an example I've heard is, um, would you hire a male babysitter? Would that give you pause? Right. <laughs> so I, heard, I see one person shaking their head, which is awesome. But I think probably a lot of us would. Uh, you want to hire Dylan? Yeah. Well, you know Dylan. So no, that I didn't. I picked oh, him really? up at care.com. Oh, is that how Dylan came here? Yes. Awesome. What a good story. <laughs> yeah, lots of, lots of interesting things let me hear. <laughs> okay. So, again, this community, I think, hopefully, is, is um, we're trying to create an enlightened society here that, that's not so rigid in our in our conditioned roles like that. You said, um, would you hire and would it give you pause? So if I shake my head, it's to the pause part. It would not give you pause to hire somebody. Good for you. Um, so have you guys been hearing about like this men's rights movement and the incels? You guys have heard about this now? So there's this, um, there's, um, especially younger men that are saying, uh, it's kind of almost of trying to return to a traditional masculinity in the sense and that women are trying to take this from us and um, just a lot of anger at women. Like the incel thing is a voluntary celibate and uh, it's women don't want to 
to, I'm not your traditional man, so they don't want to be with me. And, and there's a lot of anger towards one of the things that comes through. There's this guy, Andrew Tate, who's very popular. Um, so this is kind of taking over a little, not taking over, but there's a lot of men who are really connecting with this. And um, I'm like, well, what's this about? Like, is this a way for men to get together? I mean, I think that there's some feelings of um, something's not right in my world. It's not the way I want it to be. Like whatever traditional masculinity was before doesn't work anymore because of economic changes, especially like that provider, protector, is that something that is available to men these days as it used to be just economically. So there's a, a, that sense of, of hurt, uh, that sense of vulnerability that I think all, almost all men feel. Um, it's almost like there's this rightness um, to the looking for com uh, connectivity and community and belonging and these these groups offer that of course i think it's it's dangerous in a lot of ways because um they're not really allowing them to get vulnerable they're just allowing them to be angry at, at their vulnerability if that makes sense so i think um you know that's not what we're looking for in, in getting together um, as men but what we have here is not just a men's group, but it's a Dharma men's group, right? Dharma dudes. So how can uh, a Dharma men's group be helpful? Um, and uh, to me, I would say it's very healing to be able to be open and vulnerable with other men and fight back against all the constraints that we've talked about. Um, you know, Daniel was very open about his recovery and in his, um, you are a general, and in your, in your talk you were. And I think about, there's a lot of parallels to me between uh, being in recovery and taking refuge. Um, it's kind of this moment where you just say, this isn't working for me. I can't keep going on like this. You know, samsara, addiction, um, same damn thing, really. I, I just need to get past this and I, I need to move to something more healing. And so it's, it's letting go of, of, of a way of coping from before and moving into this new way. Sue's here. <laughs> Hi, Sue. And uh, so, you know, um, I don't identify as, as having an addiction, but I've worked a lot with people and I've gone to a lot of meetings and um, the openness and uh, genuineness that you see in a meeting is just such a wonderful healing thing. Um, Dylan, would you, I want to just play you just a couple minutes of this. Um, there was, this is back in the 90s. It's called Circle of Recovery. This guy, um, Bill Moyers, who's uh, wonderful, uh, if you might remember him, but this, this is a group of uh, African-American men who um, got together weekly, to talk about their addiction. And it wasn't 12 step, it was just them talking. And research shows that for addiction, the, the common denominator, um, best thing you can do is to be with other people, being open and vulnerable and talking about it, whether it's 12 step or another form of, of recovery, it's, it's the getting together. And I think um, just a little snippet will show you a little bit of what this guy got out of this group and a little bit of the group itself. So go ahead, Don. Yeah, it might not work. Oh. It's got the old Is it because I got this one? No, it's it's the Zoom stuff. We gotta work on that tag, huh? Okay. Well that's too bad. And it's playing on my end, but it's not fast enough. Okay. So what you can do in lieu of watching this is go to a meeting, go to an open meeting, and it'll be far more interesting than anything that you do uh, watching Netflix or anything like that. It's it's compelling real life drama. And, and I say open meeting because um, that's if it's closed, it's only for people who identify with an addiction, but anyone can go to an open meeting. 
um, and you'll really see that genuineness and openness and um, it's it's just so inspiring to me so I think um, yeah do you mean a 12 step it can be 12 step or anything like that you can go to one online but I think the live ones are, are more compelling in my opinion but um, anyway so I, I just think uh, again there's that kind of parallel of recovery and refuge um, so we're kind of recovering from all of what we've learned from this conditioned um, samsaric way of being as men. So I think we're trying to unlearn a lot of that, the kind of men that um, can be open to ourselves, to each other, to the Sangha. Um, as, as bodhisattvas, of course, we're, we're considering the bodhisattva but bodhicitta ideals of wisdom and compassion to help us out of our suffering. Um, so as one of my roles in the group, I think, is to bring things back to the Dharma, right? Lama said it has to be Dharma related. Um, everything has to come back to the Dharma. So that's a lot of my job is to kind of bring whatever our conversation, whatever it comes up for that particular uh, day, um, back to Dharma principles. Um, so I think part of what we can do in this, you know, when we're looking at the relative truth of men, women, non-binary, transgender, these are all social constructs um, that really ignore the ultimate truth that nothing exists from its own side, that our suffering begins with the delusion of misperceived self as separate and existing from its own side. So all of these constructs, gender, age, ethnicity, all these identities are just mere designations that we reify in the solid constructs. Um, and yet we must follow these conventions in the conventional world. Um, as long as we don't cling so hard to them as being self-existent. And I think that's part of where a lot of the problems occur. Um, and these gender conventions, of course, can um, engender strong feelings. So we bring everything to the Dharma, including and especially our afflictive emotions. Um, and I think we can check each other in this group. We have a responsibility to the Sangha, um, to anyone who does not identify as a man, to help them to feel safe in the presence of male Sangha. Um, a, a community is predicated on safety and vulnerability and given the history of conditioned male violence in our culture, uh, we have to check ourselves and each other to ensure that that, that safety continues here with the Sangha. Um, again, we're, we're trying to, as Lama says, create an enlightened society <laughs> here and everybody needs to feel open and safe and free here. That's what we, what we invite and, and want to create and, and keep going. And uh, without blaming anyone, of course, we, everyone has conditions that, that, and karma that creates uh, how they are. And as Lama says, um, you know, we can change our karma with intention. So that's part of what we're trying to do with the men's group. So speaking of Lama, I'm just gonna end with some of what he has to say on this topic. And then I wanna hear from y'all. Um, and especially the guys who've been coming to the group, and if you want to share what, what it means to you, I'd, I'd love to hear that, because honestly, I think what it means to me is what it means to me. And, and uh, I think probably each, each person that comes might have a different answer to that. So this is Lana. Ultimately, we can't other people. We dehumanize people when we other. Othering comes from the root delusion of independently existing fixed self and other. We're not denying biologies and history, but we're not othering and objectifying them. We need distinctions between right and left, but we have to maintain that sense of interdependence. Otherwise, everything goes haywire. Throughout history, men have objectified women as vice versa. We want to step out of that paradigm. We inherit a lot of habits, but we can change our karma with intentional habits. Dharma is an interdependent partnership kind of a model a friendship model. So that's kind of what I have to offer. I'm going to hear what you guys think. 
Questions, comments, complaints, as Lama says. <laughs> I don't know how you explain that, Lama. <laughs> So I know we're really going that the one that statistics are so high for some ones and like it's the social paths that rise to the top in those fields, right? And that's but social pathology is directly related to this awareness and this sort of ignorance of our intercultural nature. And so yeah, I, I, I wanted to point out something that I thought about the group. So in the beginning when I first talked about it, I was actually just trying to be agreeable. Uh, saying like, yeah, 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 yeah that's a good idea. idea. Actually, Actually, in the back of my mind, I was like, that's BS, right? right? We, 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 we don't really need to separate how well that worked, I mean, that can really be, you know, know it's just a little of us, you know, like, I'm telling you that, but I actually have a little bit of internal resistance that I didn't share. I wasn't really candid about that. But I thought, you know, it didn't sort of say that ideas so I should show up. So I, I, <laughs> so I started showing how to the men's groups and and at first I couldn't do that resistance you know, you know, I was like, oh no, this really needed to need to be separating ourselves and you know, I don't really identify with all this, you know, male and masculine stuff, why no girls here does either, so why are we doing this? But um, it's really uh, I hope to see the uh, effect of the group, I can have witnessed it myself. I live in a It feels like, um, it was a small group, but it feels like we're able to be connected with each other. And it is that disconnection that's so problematic for us, right? That's sort of the point. And it feels hopeful to me being able to be more open and seeing a little bit of the barriers coming down, you know, and, and seeing that connection um, happening within the group. It gives me some hope that that can sort of um, ripple out, right? And it can increase the Connectedness, the lack of separation in the people who come to the group, and in that sense, can contribute to this enlightened society. And for that, I'm really grateful. I appreciate you. Yeah. Hi, I'm unmuting, but I'm not talking. I'm letting other people talk. I think listening to the talk today, one of the things that has come up for me um, very strongly is the word strength. And um, where, where does that fit into the traditional way of how they have um, wanted to see themselves into the scene in the world? Um, when I think that some of what's happened is there's a discussion around vulnerability. Um, and how is that in tension with the traditional desire to be strong and perceived as strong? Being, um, um, being vulnerable, not necessarily because uh, um, people don't want to connect, but because there's a perception of strength that what people want to continue to. Um, Embody, and so I think that as for me living here today, I will continue to reflect on masculinity and its relationship to the word strength. I know that um, as a strong woman myself, I get put in my place quite a lot <laughs> in the title show and the amount of strength um, because it's seen as a certain ability. So I think this is a interesting topic. I can just touch on that. I, mean, I don't know, it's just for me personally, the only strength isn't so much overcoming as it is enduring. So the more you endure and you keep composure, keep calm, keep kindness, to have that strength, 
Wow. Or to overcome something or overpower something. That's not necessarily strength because you can't be the strongest. I mean, that's impossible, right? But you can endure more than and just keep who you are. I mean, I don't know. That's just. Yeah. So we can redefine strength as, as something that includes um, caregiving and, and compassion and kindness. And, um, I do think we that's part of why we come to temple, hopefully, um, to meditation groups, to the men's group is um, just, yeah, being able to be with like-minded people or not always like-minded people, but just being with each other in a way, right? Song is one of the three duels, like something about the, the interconnection that we co-create something um perhaps that's right i know it's not the right way to put it but better than samsara like we can kind of deconstruct samsara and just say this isn't working we can we can uh, be a part of a, a community that's looking for something that works better for us and, and the world that's the right way Comments, questions. I just feel um, that I think of my two sons that um, I raised for alone for half of their life, and um, and I, in what you're saying, the things that you're saying, I, I see those struggles with them as well, particularly the loneliness. Um, and I also see the ways that they try to overcome that. And it's interesting with my younger son. Uh, he's, if you look at him, he is the uh, archetype of masculinity. He's um, six foot four, 300 pounds, all muscle. And he goes to the gym and he gets vulnerable with other guys. That's actually his community. And, and the funny thing is they're, they're all, I, I call some, uh, there are some communities that I feel like are head centered, but his gym, they're really heart centered, right? They're all doing this, like playing these masculine roles, but with each other, it's, it's like what you were talking about with these men's groups or with the, the academy, the, um, right, the Citadel, that they're comfortable uh, they're, they're, they feel so comfortable with their masculinity that they allow themselves to be a little vulnerable, which I think is interesting because, like I said, they're the, the archetype of what you would think is just masculinity and toxic, but they aren't. Um, anyways, I'll, I'll be walking away from this conversation thinking about my sons and how to help them. Thank you, Linda. I had, a, um, I think one of the things that I really appreciate about being a therapist is um, I, it's like this mini sangha almost like where we, like, we can co-create it in reality. Like I had a, a woman recently come and say, I, I chose you because I hate men <laughs> and I want to learn not to hate men. Wow. I want to learn to, um, raise my sons in, in a way that I can benefit them. So, I mean, that's, that's powerful, right? That conditioned something, I don't know yet, something's happened to lead her to say that, but um, yeah. So, you know, and then with the men I work with, we can move past their anger and like that. So it's, it's a, it's a gift to me to be able to, to do that work. And, create that, that connection like that. Um, I, just I just wanted, wanted to, add to add just a little, little bit, bit to the, the, the babysitter water. comment. Because <laughs> if we're being, if I'm being completely honest and vulnerable, 
I will say that when I was looking through profiles and I came across a male profile, it did give me pause, of course, you know, and I had to look at that and say, well, I asked myself, well, why, why wouldn't I consider a male caregiver for my child? And I'm a big fan, especially in my work of storytelling, of deconstructing or addressing your biases, because we all have them. And it's better if you actually look at them and say, this is what they are, so that way you can deconstruct them. So I did. I'm really glad I did. And then I also thought about the fact that, you know, my son doesn't have grandfathers in his life and his uncle is barely around. So I was like, you know, he could really benefit actually from a male caregiver. So that ended up pushing his resume up to a little bit higher. And then, of course, when I met him, you know, it was a, definitely an immediate match. But um, I, I think it is okay, you know, even as Buddhists who view ourselves as more open to acknowledge that there is implicit bias there, you know, and that helps us rise above it. And as a woman in the Sangha, I will also say that I support what you're doing in the group. I think it's awesome and I think it's needed. So thank you for doing it. I just said it's a nice place to stop. So we're going to do closing prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezing Tianjin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display, the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of a flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Songkapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losangdrapa, I make request at your holy feet. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Rinpoche will not be here next weekend. It will be me. So please come. Huh? Oh, I'm speaking about uh, healing through narrative. So there's there's a lot of aspects to that. Hopefully it'll be beneficial. I believe so. Yes, that's what I was told. <laughs> Any other announcements? Yes, so uh, Lama's going on retreat for a couple weeks, and it's a big expense, obviously, to leave his business and all of that good stuff. So um, you can go to Lion's Roar uh, website and donate to his retreat, and that will help um, him fill his tank so that he can continue to be of great benefit to all of us. Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi